good evening or good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to the last, to the sixth and last uh, encounter in the uh, uh, Institute of Holocaust and Gen Genocide and Memory Studies uh, at Am Amherst University with cooperation with us, the Abraham Harman Research Institute on Contemporary Jewry at the Hebrew University. And this is part of the annual series, uh, Encounters, Conversation on Racism, Antisemitism, and Islamophobia. Unfortunately, uh, Alon Conf Professor Alon Confino, the head of the uh, Institute in UMass could not attend. So I will have the pleasure to hold this conversation with uh, Professor Magda Tetter uh, on her book, Blood Libel on the Trial of Antisemitic Mess, 2020 by Harvard University Press uh, alone. But before we start some housekeeping. Uh, so first, uh, the, um, you can post your questions um, whenever you want, but please do it in the Q&A feature uh, and not in the chat. The chat will maybe it's already closed and will be closed. So all questions in the Q&A, whenever you are uh, most invited and encouraged to post your questions as soon as they come up to your mind. Um, now, uh, the uh, Institute for Holocaust, Genocide and Memory Studies at UMass uh, is on Facebook and has an email list. Uh, so you can subscribe by emailing to us uh, to them, um, and I will I we will post the e email in the chat box in a second. Um, uh, the whole encounter event, including this one, events, including this one, are recorded, and uh, you can see them, you can view them on the virtual archive li library of the uh, Institute of Holocaust, Genocide, and Memory Studies uh, on YouTube, on their, on their YouTube uh, page. Um, I think uh, that is all. Just let me uh, add that we will, we will continue this series also next year, but we didn't uh, choose yet a uh, theme. So we hope to see you all uh, next year. Uh, so most of our, all of our encounters were 20th, 20th uh, or even 21st second uh, uh, anti-Semitic Islamophobia or racism issues, but now we go back mostly to the uh, early modern period. And we are so happy and honored to uh, host uh, Professor Magda Tetter, who is a professor of history and the Schwedler Chair of Judaic Studies at the Fordham University. She's the author of Jews and Hectics in Catholic Poland, 2005, Sinners on Trial, 2011, and the book we, are, we will be discussing today, Blood Libel on the Trail of a, an Antisemitic Myth, 2020, uh, by Harvard University Press. And uh, She's written a lot, dozens of uh, uh, articles and book chapters, and she has won her book, but, uh, the book we are talking about today, we won the 2020 National Jewish Book Award, the George Mosse Prize from the American Historical Association, and uh, the Ronald Bynton Prize from the 16th Century Society. Tether has received pre prestigious fellowship, including from the John, John Simpson, the Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the Common Center of Scholars and Writers in New York Public Library, and many others. She has served as the Vice President for publication of the American Jewish Studies Association. So um, we are in, indeed very, very honored and happy to uh, host you on our encounter series. And I will ask you the first question, with, uh, which is uh, which we ask all uh, all our hosts. It's a very, if you give us a framework, give, can you please just just describe your book in in general terms and what you actually what it is actually about? What was the initial motivation to embark on this huge research project? And it is a huge research project. And like, just give the audience an idea, so it will take us into the discussion. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. It's uh, it's really wonderful to engage with uh, an audience and readers uh, to discuss uh, a book that one has written. 
It's an interesting question. I'll start with the question, the, the second part of the question, because the book, uh, though it is big and thick and I hope not too intimidating, uh, did not start as an idea to be that big of a book. I did not, uh, first of all, I didn't want to write this book and I didn't intend to write this book. And as we chatted before, I have a piece, a piece of evidence that is I have a note from the archives um, so uh, after seeing a, a set of trial records uh, from 1475, that it was neat to have seen this trial record of Jews in Trento 1475, but not for me. <laughs> so I really didn't intend to write this book. Um, the book is um, about uh, on, on the topic of obviously blood libel, one of the um, most persistent um lies that that still is pervasive in society and reverberates even uh, in today's society um that is the accusation that jews killed uh, christian children um it emerged in the 12th century and then it um spread um uh first as a as a uh, murder libel that uh, uh, that charged that jews killed these children to reenact jesus's crucifixion and then in the 13th century, the blood motif was added, which became, it became a blood libel. That is that Jews kill not only to reenact crucifixion, but also to um, extract the, the child's blood. Um, so that's the book. Uh, the book was initially conceived as a, as a com I am an early modernist. So I was, uh, I was interested to see why this accusation persisted in Eastern Europe, but it largely disappeared in, in the West uh, of Europe, in German lands and others, with a few spattering of cases in Italy. So it was mostly a comparative Italian Catholic uh, and Polish uh, book originally. But then I, um, I began to follow the sources, the trail, which uh, which, uh, which is sort of um, intimated in the subtitle of the book. And it ended up being this big book uh, because as I saw references, I would find a source as it would take me to this archive or to, it would take me to this printed book or it would take me to that record. And, it, and, I, and I ended up unfolding this again, this trail uh, that uh, essentially um, starts in the 12th century and goes to the end of the uh, 18th century, though certainly the story doesn't end in the where I ended, um, and there are books that came that covered the period after my book ends. Okay, so let, let's go. Let's go into the details a little bit. Um, you start the story of uh, William, uh, whose mutilated bodies was found near the English town of Norwich in uh, 1144. And that's the first tale accusing Jews of killing Christian uh, for ritual purposes. So the question is why then? Why, why does it appear the first time in the 12th century after more than uh, a thousand years of Christianity and some kind of rivalry with, with Judaism? So all of a sudden after, at a certain point, it pops up. So what, what, what were the circumstances, the context for that? So it's very interesting. I mean, the story doesn't really, the story of William of Norwich, um, who, which you mentioned, is, uh, is typically seen as the first such story. And I'll say it is a story. Uh, that is, the child's body was found, but immediately Jews were not accused and there was no story right away. It was only um, years, decades, even decades later when that story came to be articulated and written. Um, and that story, um, if you read the story of the, by Thomas of Monmouth of the story of the passion of William is really a, a work that seeks to create a cult of the boy and that draws all attention on sort of parallels between the boy and Jesus's passion. And that is one of the clues that tells you why the 12th century. The first those, of those stories that accused Jews of these uh, murders, I call them murder libels um, better than ritual murder or, or others, murder libels are um, a focus on the reenactment of the passion of Christ. 
um, that Jews do it, uh, you know, periodically around Easter uh, to, uh, to reenact that uh, the Easter Passover. And there is a, the reason why it emerges in the 12th century is that until the 12th century, Christians focus on worshiping Jesus as God, as the sort of glorious God. And then in the, in the um, uh, 12th century, um, you begin to see a shift in the focus, liturgical focus on the passion of Christ. So once you shift from glory to passion, Jews become part, a much more prominent part of that story. And the suffering of Jesus becomes much more prominent part of that story. So, so, so the, the reason why William of Norwich's story uh, seems so kind of familiar and like Gavin Langmore said that, you know, was invented and invented, it's because it draws on the passion narrative. And that is what is so familiar. It's not because those ideas were existing um, at, the, at the time. Um, so it's a Christian, internal Christian development that lends itself to being projected then onto, onto Jews. Um, the, real, the real Jews who are suddenly noticed in the midst of the Christian society. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is very, really very interesting because it, as you describe it, it, initially it has nothing to do with the Jews, but now we move fast forward and your real story, however, begins in the trial of Trent and that's the, the whole book is uh, actually about that of uh, 1475. So what actually happened in Trent and why is it so important? And again, why then, why the end of the mm -hmm. 15th century, early modern? Why did it happen in the late 15th century? Why is the tale early modern Europe and not middle ages Europe? And what's the next? Big step here. This is really a, a, a great question because usually when, um, if anybody has heard about blood libel or the ritual murder accusation, people think about it as a medieval story, that it's a medieval accusation. And indeed it emerges in the middle ages, 12th century, and then the blood motif added in the 13th century. But it is really not a medieval story. It becomes really grounded in European consciousness and imagination in the, uh, in the late 15th century and on. And the, the trial of Jews in Trento, which is what I saw in the archives and thought, nah, not interesting, uh, um, was, um, was a trial of a tiny Jewish community in the aftermath of death of a toddler named Simon, who disappeared on the Monday Thursday, the Thursday before Easter, and was presumed to have drowned, perhaps, and then um, and then his body washed up under a Jewish home. There are a lot of canals in, in Trento from the Adish uh, River. And uh, Jews reported finding the body, and then they were um, arrested and, and tried. The, um, the, th this was um, not the first trial, not the first since, uh, you know, since the, the, the stories emerged. Uh, there were other accusations of Jews, although not many of them were actual trials or anything happened to Jews. Some of them were just stories and rumors that ended up being recorded as facts um, in Chronicles. Um, but these previous stories were local. They were known maybe if there was a shrine, maybe pilgrims knew it, uh, but they were not wildly disseminated. What happened in 1475, and the date 1475 is important for two reasons. One is it was a Jubilee year in Catholic tradition. So there were a lot of pilgrims who were going to Rome. And you can go from Northern Europe to Rome different ways. And the bishop uh, would have loved for the pilgrims to stop in Trento on their way to a pilgrims are like tourists, they bring money. Um, and the, the body that the, the child's body that was found provided an excellent uh, opportunity, uh, but to make such a child a martyr you needed to be sure that Jews were the guilty ones. Other, a dead child is a dead child. It doesn't, doesn't mean anything. 
but if it was a dead child killed by Jews in place of Jesus, then it's a different story. Then it's a martyr and it's a, uh, it's a, uh, a, a, a holy relic. So uh, the narrative was very much set right away, just a few days after the body was found, it was printed. And that's another importance of the 1475 date. Um, the events in Trento uh, happened just a couple of decades, and we think it's all oh, long time, a couple of decades, but in the pre-modern period, two decades is not such a big deal, and technology, with the new technology of the printing press. The Bishop of Trento was very much um, aware of the power of print. He was an avid reader, an avid book collector. We have his library, we have annotations on his books. So he was certainly um, interested in printing and he understood the power of the print. Um, so he immediately invested money to tell the story. And he, he invested money to tell the stories in different ways, uh, in word and in image. He invested in art that was static art on churches and, and paintings. And he invested also money in uh, producing um, uh, broadsides, like uh, sort of like posters that would tell the uh, visually would tell the story of, of Simon. So print, and what happens is we do not have iconography of the story before Tr Trento. Like we don't have any um, sort of remnants um, of of the icon of how Jews did it, what it meant. So the story of, of Simon and what happens in Trento in 1475 and the aftermath invents the, what Italian uh, art historians have called the iconographic vocabulary of blood libel. That is suddenly what was spread as rumors and maybe oral stories became visualized and became kind of embodied and imaginable. Uh, and, and because you have the technology to spread it, it spread far and wide, and the bishop made sure that it also enters important books like Chronicles of the History of the World. So it's actually both reasons you gave are very materialistic. I mean, one about tourism and money, and one about technology. So it's much more than ideology or ideas. It's the materialistic world that shapes this life. And, and politics. Uh, uh, the bishop also had uh, uh, an ax to grind against the pope, and he wanted to assure his own authority. So when the pope actually intervened, because popes in the Middle Ages had condemned such accusations against Jews, it was only... Um, a sort of an encouragement for the bishop to actually uh, double down on the accusation to prove it because he had also some power, political power issues with the papacy. Um, so, um, so it's very much, it's a very much, and that's why it's a, it's a story of power, politics, and media. Really, it's the first deployment of mass media to disseminate, uh, to, to have a story go viral, if you want to use uh, the language of, of, uh, of our times. Um, because before images, um, they existed in, in early, earlier printed books, and, uh, but they were largely generic. This is the first time we have the use of this new technology to depict, to depict something current. Uh, through images as well as through word. Yeah. So again, as you for the uh, previous question, it does not have to do directly with the Jews. It's more like that's right. And um, so, can you describe a little bit for those who haven't read the book? Uh, so, what were the co consequences of, like, the long-term consequences of these of this development? Of of the uh, of the dissemination of, of those stories. yeah and the blood libel yeah once the blood libel got its life of its own it started to spread also to East Europe yes it becomes uh, so it it enters uh, all kinds of chronicles 
uh, it enter, it develops, as I mentioned, iconography about Jews. That is, Sarah Lipton has shown, obviously, anti-Jewish iconography developing in the Middle Ages, but the iconography of Jews as killers of Christian children uh, and that sort of Im imaginability of that in invented crime uh, becomes, uh, becomes widely spread. What also happens, and this is important, that the story um, enters very authoritative sources, very authoritative books, that Europe's uh, Christian, maybe even not Christian, but Europe's intellectuals are reading to learn. And it enters the story of Simon and then others, enter also uh, works that are not about Jews. And this is important. You didn't have to, um, be interested in Jews to learn about these stories, like these histories of the world, for instance. The most famous, probably, even those of you who are modernists may have heard, was the Nuremberg Chronicle, because it's so beautifully illustrated, it's become quite famous, certainly in the modern times. And, and uh, so when you have something from the um, creation of the world to, let's say, 1478 or 1493, whatever, whenever was the end of, day of a given book, and you have all these events that talk about kings, queens, you know, popes, wars, Jesus is alive, everything, and then you have scattered around those about a dozen stories about Jews that are all negative, that are all portraying Jews as killers or as Jews as desecrating holy Christian items with no other stories, you begin to kind of develop a certain pattern. So what it develops is that the, the dissemination of these stories in print uh, develops a pattern of thinking about Jews. Uh, in a certain way among intellectuals. Um, and it is fascinating because I saw a reference and it was like, wow, this is amazing. In, in a 17th century Polish book, one of the authors says, well, I used to you know, hang out with Jews. I used to drink in their taverns. I used to you know, uh, attend their you know, whatever places and I used to drink with them. And I had no idea that they did such things. I am surprised I'm still alive, right? So he read it later on in books and began to see then Jews who he encountered in everyday life in a different way. So maybe- what, Yeah, I'll maybe just okay. add one more question, one, one more point that then these stories become, because they come from authoritative sources, they also become proofs of, as evid of evidence that Jews do such things. And then they are also used in court to support other accusations against Jews. So maybe you can share with us some of the, those disvocabulary images. Yes, I, I can yeah. certainly show you the, uh, the impact of, uh, of, of print. So you can see here, this is one of those like uh, broadsides, just one page prints that were, uh, that were printed in, uh, in Trento right after trial. And this is the image of, of, of Simon being supposedly killed by and martyred as as a as a as a Christ figure, and what is interesting is that all these figures are names. That that is, it has this this reality, the sense of of, of realness of this thing. This is an image of a book uh, of text that was written on April fourth. So Simon disappears on April twenty on March twenty sixth. Jews are arrested on March twenty. Um, 8th or 27th, um, and then by April 4th, there is a whole narrative with a miracle at the bottom, at the end of it, um, uh, already in place. And I, I could see it in the trend trials when I reread them, not in the order that were organized by the bishop and those who were involved in it, but actually chronologically, you can see how gradually the, the rec trial records and testimonies are aligning with this narrative in, in vocabulary and in concepts. Um, then you had you know, broadsides like this to encourage pilgrims to come. So here you have the body of Simon with uh, the passion tools, the nails and others, and pilgrims coming uh, with some uh, uh, votive offerings uh, to the, the shrine. 
And here is a book, and I apologize for the blackness of the, of the um, background, was one of the first illustrated books that uh, actually told the story along with the illustration. Uh, that is what is on the page is depicted on the, uh, on the uh, side and it has 12 illustrations. I will only show you uh, a, a couple of them that tell this story of Simon. So it becomes very vivid. And then here you have an image of, um, of a, a chronicle to which Simon's story was inserted uh, a few, just a few years later. It's a massive book that tells the world uh, history from the creation until uh, 1485. And here is the famous Nuremberg Chronicle to the left with the image of, of Simon, which um, probably many of you have seen because it, especially if you study anti-Semitism in the modern period, because it, emer a, a, it becomes a, a vocabulary and image that is used very much by anti-Semites and it became um, uh, popularized by the Nazis. And then it, he enters the story of, uh, so Simon's uh, cult is condemned by the Pope, but then it's implicitly recognized in the uh, 1580s uh, by being inserted to a liturgical calendar here. And that is an authoritative uh, legal and religious text by the church. Um, you can see the iconographic language. Uh, I'll just run through it briefly and then I'll just show you quickly so you can see the, the glory of Simon. And this is actually very interesting when you, when you have the focus on the killing or the, his dead body, it becomes a much more gruesome. When you begin to focus on his glory, like, like Jesus's glory, uh, Jews disappear from the story and that kind of cruelty disappears. And that's the iconography in Italy, whereas that cruel iconogra iconography focusing on Simon's dead body is, um, appears in uh, Northern European uh, across the Alps uh, as, a, as, a, as a way to, um, to, to illustrate and imagine uh, Jews. And that is all from uh, Northern European. So there is different sort of culture of uh, thinking about Jews, but you can see how that that imagery just gets repeated again and again across uh, across Europe. Um, on the website, you can play with the maps, um, but I also want to show you these uh, chronicles in which the the story is included. And these are this is kind of limited vocabulary um, in these chronicles that uh, highlight the stories about Jews. So if you don't know anything about Jews and you only learn about that, uh, you get a pretty kind of biased uh, and negative view of um, what Jews are. And yeah, again, it's yeah. again and again and again, and just as repeated. So here comes my next question. Um, so you, you, because your book is not only about this anti-Semitic tale, but it is also about the production of uh, but but it's also about um, very powerful agents uh, within the Christian world that or either protect Jews or dispute this tale or mm -hmm. and come sometimes protecting the Jews sometimes as you said into internal politics within the church or within the the, the state. So how do we? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. And how do we balance those two aspects of the history of this tale? Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree with you that um, we, we tend to focus on um, the anti-Jewish aspects of the story, or in general, when we teach about anti-Semitism or racism, we tend to focus on the manifestations of those hatreds. But it is equally important to think about um, the people who didn't accept it, the people who fought back, the people who uh, protected Jews, or you know, if you extend it to broader questions of racism, groups that are oppressed, um, and such people existed. And the reason in some way why we have such an um, amount of literature, why this bishop, for instance, spent so much money and energy 
to promote these, th this cult and this story is because there was opposition. Uh, and uh, the other thing is why we remember the, the persecution of, of Jews. And I say in the book that the blood that was spilled was the blood of, spilled by Jews who were accused of these, of these um, uh, crimes, which they didn't commit, is because these were the stories that entered wider uh, circulation. That is, those anti-Jewish writers were interested in proving that Jews are these horrible, cruel criminals who are out there to kill you and kill your children and steal your property and do all these nasty things. Um, so they were eager to promote that. Um, Jews, on the other hand, would those who were affected directly by these accusations wanted to commemorate the victims of these uh, trials. So they also told the stories uh, of, of, of those who, who were um, burned and executed. Um, what is what I discovered is that actually, and this is something that your audience can go on the website and look at the maps, uh, is that the majority of the cases and majority of the uh, situations, Jews were actually acquitted or nothing happened. There was an accusation, but it was dismissed or nobody took it seriously. Um, it was, it was in, a, in, a, in a minority of cases, um, still significant number, where Jews were actually per prosecuted or, um, or executed, that were, uh, Jews were killed. But these remained in the archives because they didn't serve memory on the one hand um, or that propagandistic aspect of anti-Jewish literature on the other hand. Um, before we move to the concluding questions about the like more broad historiographical aspects, and then we open it to Q to the questions over there. We already have quite a lot on the in the Q and A box. I want to ask you something uh, like um, in your book, you showed that the Jews were obviously not passive victims of this tale, but also active agents. And this is quite clear. And one of the most impressive literary reactions to it was the book uh, uh, Shevet Yehuda from approximately 1520, written by Solomon uh, Ibn Verga, who was himself expelled from Portugal a few decades earlier. This book became very popular over the years, as you describe it, both in Ashkenazi and Sephardi world. However, as you write, and, and I quote, uh, these Sephardi works can be uh, contrasted with the Yiddish works addressed uh, blood libels. The Yiddish uh, editions of Solomon Ibn Verga's Shvuat uh, Shevet Yehuda, beginning with the first one published in Krakow in 1591, substantially transformed the classic Spanish Jewish historiography and the Sephardic Weltanschauen into a radically different sort of work. So this is really amazing and, and very interesting. So you, 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 can you tell us about that? I mean, the yes. reactions, how the, like the two basic spheres of Jews, Jewish spheres differ on this? It's, it, it was very interesting. So uh, one of the things uh, that became clear that there was a, a mass amount of obviously Christian literature material about it. But it was very difficult to find Jewish voices in it beyond the materials that were provided to us by Christian sources, whether it's the trials that may have included the voices of Jews, but may have included the manufactured voices of Jews, right? Um, uh, 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 certainly sort of translated into, you know, if Jews spoke uh, one language and the co court records are in, in Latin, there is a whole going on uh, there. So it was very difficult to find Jewish voices. There were some poems um, that were written, you know, uh, keynote to commemorate the martyrdom of some of the victims, some, some songs. Um, so what, what I noticed is that in the few works that we have, of Jewish writers, of literary responses, we have a very kind of clean breakdown 
of the kind of epistemological understanding of blood labels. And one is the Sephardic world and Shevet Yehuda being one of, one of them, where you, um, where you have these stories, and these are really tales that may be based on, on some historical events, but they are mostly tales um, in which Jews are accused and it becomes very clear that um, they are not guilty, that the accusers were lying, um, whether it's because, you know, even if Jews uh, during trial were, um, were tortured and, uh, and confessed. But at the end, some kind of um, natural world of political development would happen that would, would show that Jews were, in fact, didn't do it, whether the person was still alive, whether the, the killers confessed that, yes, we just wanted to expel Jews because they are usurers or whatever it was, um, intervention of a king, intervention of some other uh, historic or real world event. So everything go, uh, ends well. Um, in the Ashkenazi sphere, and this is very interesting, this is what Michael Stanislavski called Ashkenization of the Shevet Yehuda, is that it's not just a translation into Yiddish, it actually is an adaptation to, uh, to Ashkenazi uh, sensibilities. And in that, if the story ended well in Shevet Yehuda, the original version, because the king discovered something or the child was alive or something like that, human agents, in the Ashkenazi um, version and the Yiddish version, it, if it ends well at all, it ends because of divine intervention. And then any kind of references to Jews confessing under torture, even though then they are proven right that they didn't, are omitted from the Yiddish version. The, um, the Yiddish songs and tales, as well as the Shevet Yehuda, uh, show Jews never confessing under torture. And, um, and that is a, a way to say that Jews were not guilty because they were not confessing under torture. In Shevet Yehuda and the Sephardic world, Jews confess under torture even though they were not guilty to show that torture was not a, a good tool. And that is part of the Sephardic world, that is they experienced the Inquisition and, and torture and, and these debates over um, over the use of torture and the validity of the testimony of torture was very, um, very active, very, uh, very well established. Whereas torture was part of the legal system in north of the Alps and the Holy Roman Empire and also later on in Eastern Europe. So if you condemned torture, you were essentially condemning the whole legal system. And so Jews were accepting the torture as part of the legal process, but then they were affirming their innocence by telling the stories that Jews never confessed under torture, that they never you know, broke, they never uh, told on anybody. And these stories also served as a kind of model for Jews who were experiencing these trials to withstand not to break, to give them strength because God would in the end, maybe not save their lives, but would be with them, would reward them. So I now want to move to, uh, to a more general or I would say historiographical question. Uh, as, as is well known in the historiography of antisemitism, there is uh, two, I would say, pose with many gray zones in the middle, but oh, one that emphasizes antisemitism continuous, even if ever evolving character. And the other one, which views it as a general signifier for very different and discontinuous historical phenomena. And we know both, uh, bo bo you know, very big uh, scholars, very great scholars on both sides. But following your, your thorough study of almost 1000 years of blood life, I mean, you, you, you concentrate on a, on a shorter period, but all around here, you stretch it for almost a thousand years. What is your position from this perspective? What can the history of the Barad Libel teach us about this particular uh, historical question, historiographical question? 
So I think I'm probably in the gray zone somewhere <laughs> on this question. That is, I, um, I think it is historically constructed. That is, um, that anti-Semitism or these tales are historically constructed. And we have to pay a very close attention to how they are constructed and when and why and when they get activated. That said, I, I think the, the, the sort of looking at the mechanisms of the, the, the production and then dissemination of, of that myth uh, made me realize how, in, how um, the, how to phrase it, um, how much we become, uh, how much they play, play a role in, in creating certain mental frameworks and habits of thinking that are very difficult to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uproot, right, and to, to end. And that uh, it creates a certain sort of what I call epistemic communities that it would, whatever source of knowledge you consume, you are influenced by that kind of source of knowledge and then it's very difficult to break out of that so i think a, the it becomes a kind of reservoir of, of of troops and ideas that can be historically activated at very specific moments in time um and it's um I think there's continuity between the the, the modern and the pre-modern, um, but it, it also there is a, a change. But I think the sort of imp importance about developing habits of thinking and seeing um, the the world, whether in this case Jews, uh, through the lens of what. Uh, what we read and the the culture we consume, I think, uh, I think is there, and and that's why, um, though I see specific moments and I see this sort of, um, not every dead child resulted in accusations against Jews. That would be a lot. I mean, children died all the time, um, uh, in in pre-modern Europe. Um, but, um, but so we have to pay very close attention to the moments and why this emerges political, you know, economic that we discuss in, in the example of Trento, but also, uh, but also think about why people might begin to think those terms and, and how those longer stories um, continue and how they permutate. Yeah, so you also, in some of your talks, and perhaps even in the book, you mentioned, for example, um, the, the murderer in, in, in Pittsburgh, who, who, who was influenced uh, by, by, by this. Can, can you tell us uh, like uh, two minutes of where we are now with this uh, libel? Yes, yeah, so uh, it was, um, as my book was going to, to production, um, the shooting in the Poway Synagogue near San Diego took place. Ah, okay, so yes, it was in San Diego, and uh, and to my surprise, um, you know, and it was after other shootings have taken place and other anti-Semitic attacks were taking place in 2018, 2019, but this one was particularly meaningful in the context of my work because the shooters. Um, um, online manifesto specifically mentioned Simon of Trent and specifically mentions that, si that, that, that Simon of Trent and, and he says other children um, are being avenged by him um, uh, and, the, and Jews today pay the, the price and pay with their lives for those crimes of the past. So this was quite shocking to me to see a reference to a story from the 15th century in a shooting manifesto. And the reason why uh, that story remained is, it, 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 and, and it's not that this shooter <laughs> read early modern chronicles or works about Trent in 1475. It's because that this shooter and other um, one to white supremacist anti-Semites, but also um, co consumers of anti-Semitic uh, literature in the Middle East um, have uh, are reading 
the Nazi uh, works uh, or works based uh, on Nazi works, historical Nazi works. And the Nazis were very, very smart in um, providing footnotes to their allegations. So the reason why many of you have seen, as I mentioned, that 15th century woodcut of Simon of Trent is not because it was particularly famous at the time. It wasn't. I, had, I, I did not see a single repetition of that image in any published works I've examined in the early modern period. There were other ways, other images that kept being repeated, but not this one. This image came into to the attention of the Nazis when the Nuremberg Chronicle was published uh, in a facsimile edition in 1933 in Leipzig. And after that, in May 1934, um, their Sturmer published a whole image, uh, a whole issue devoted to un un the murder plot, as they called it, Jews met murder plot. And they republished some of that iconography that I showed you, um, those woodcuts, including the, the woodcut from the Nuremberg Chronicle. And they produced a whole list of the supposed crimes of Jews uh, with footnotes saying, this comes from this chronicle, this comes from the lives of saints, this comes from that, uh, making it authoritative supported knowledge. And that's the, the conduit to white supremacist knowledge of the early modern period and Jewish history uh, in the pre-modern period. This is a fascinating. So be, before I move to the to the to the Q and A, okay, I'll ask you the last question. If you can tell us a little bit about your current research project, and in what ways, if at all, it stems from uh, this uh, blood libel project? Is it connected uh, in in any way? So um, my next book is actually coming out next year. Uh, with Princeton, and it's um, it's called uh, uh, Christian Supremacy: Reckoning with anti with the Roots of Antisemitism and Racism, and it um, it is not directly related to uh, the Blood Libel Project, but it is related to some of the thinking about the mental habits of why uh, certain things persist, and what's what struck me is that some vocabulary that is used um, about uh, uh, African-Americans, Black Americans in the United States um, is very similar to the vocabulary that has been used um, uh, about Jews. And although some scholars, uh, many scholars have sort of noted that, that the, uh, those who are anti-Semitic are also uh, racist and you know and vice versa. Um, what what I examine was the uh, I used the, the lens of servitude to think about and slavery um, of uh, and social hierarchy in the way that the uh, Christian um, tradition uh, presented Jews as as inferior as. Um, uh, in perpetual servitude um, that then essentially in the modern times resulted in the um, rejection of Jewish equality and citizenship, but also gave rise to the trope of the Jewish power. And the same rejection of Black equality in the United States stems from not the idiom of servitude, but from actual slave enslavement. Um, so uh, the book is about sort of thinking through these ideas and how they are replicated even when people forget their actual uh, roots and their original meaning, but how they are replicated through the, the, the historical periods. Okay, so now we have a whole lot of uh, questions in the Q&A. And I'm not sure we'll be able to read all of them, so I'll, I'll try to combine some. To um, so there's a there are a few questions about previous imagery of the world of Jews before the 12th century. One is asking why don't you relate to Apion for the first of the first century? In quotes, the 
the Jews would kidnap a Greek, fatten him, convey him to a wood, slay him, sacrifice his body, and swear an oath of hostility against the Greeks. And all the uh, all the uh, and all this they do did once a year. So this uh, already from the first century in the Greek world. And someone else asks, does it have any connection to the imagery of the Jews as a well poisoners and other so okay it starts in the 12th century but there's some roots or even precedent is before so can you can you relate to what if, if you what happened to, to yes. 1000 years before yes i mean appian does have that uh, that story it, it disappears it doesn't appear again and again um and so that's why it doesn't seem to play an important role and nobody ever refers to it Right, so nobody ever refers to it. So it's it 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 it, it disappears, um, even though it's uh, tantalizingly um, uh, connecting with what what happens later. And I think that one of the points that I want to make, and this is what I was trying to distinguish between facts and stories, is that some of that, um, some of those uh, don't appear or reappear uh, at all until they are dug out maybe by even modern historians who then sort of string them in that continuity of, of those ideas. Um, and so, so, so again, it exists, but it doesn't seem to have had any significance. And, and then in the 12th century, in a very different context, with very different cultural references, this new story emerges. And it has uh, much more to do with Jews as killers of Christ than, um, than with uh, you know, Appian or any other thing. The, the well, well poisoners, um, that is a, 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 a accusation that emerges after um, the blood libel accusations. But it also um, it emerges from much more from the idea of um, a Jewish enmity to Christianity. Um, that, so, so all those tropes are relating back to Jews as enemies of Christ and Jews as enemies of Christianity that are being played up um, in, in, um, in any of those, uh, of those stories. Uh, there is the conspiracy, obviously, story in the uh, in the 14th century, um, uh, well poisoning um, uh, accusations. They, they do enter chronicles, but usually they enter chronicles as uh, examples of then a just punishment of Jews through either burning them or expelling them. Um, so. So the, the, they are definitely connected, and the, the overarching idea is the idea of Jews as enemies of Christians, and that goes back to the story of Jews as enemies of Jesus and rejecting rejecting Jesus. Now there are a few questions about the prevalence of of of, of this in the Catholic world versus the Protestant world, or even Eastern Orthodox region. Can you say about that in like putting it in geography in place and in, in time? Yeah, it's great. And and again, if you go to the website, you can there are interactive maps, so you can actually play with time and 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 the dots will appear and disappear. Um, but definitely the um, the uh, accusations disappeared from the western from Western Europe largely. Um, after the Reformation. And that is something that scholars have noted and often attributed it to um, the Reformation. Um, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't mean that the Protestants did not accept these stories. And we see them in, for instance, Sebastian Munster's um, uh, Cosmographia, the, the, the description of the world in which he, and he was a Hebrews, he knew uh, very well uh, that Jews certainly didn't do such things. He nonetheless included these stories. That said, the Protestants were much more um, interested in Hebrew and studying Hebrew 
uh, to learn about um, either origins of Christianity or to um, gain knowledge that would then help them convert Jews and prove to them that Jesus was in fact the Messiah. That allowed them to verify that no Jewish texts say anything about killing Christians or consuming blood, quite the opposite. In Poland, and this is what I meant earlier when I said is sort of what you consume in terms of your knowledge, sources of knowledge matter. In Eastern Europe, where in the early modern period, that blood libel is really the phenomenon of the early modern period, not the medieval period. Um, this kind of knowledge that is prominent uh, in the Protestant world does not take place. And, um, and the knowledge about Jews is either firsthand through living with Jews, and usually accusations do not come out of people who live with Jews, but usually from um, uh, political figures or ecclesiastical figures or people who have read about these and bring these cases to. Uh, so there is definitely correlation, which is why I initially thought I was going to compare Italy and Poland as two Catholic um, lands in early modern period, but then I ended up going all over. Mm -hmm. And um, there's another question here. I combined two questions that I think can go together. One asks um, if, if perhaps the myths were activated at times when there was a political or social psychology, psychological need to have a scapegoat. So is it connected to this scapegoat mechanism and times of the, that it is the, it used? And another question which might be connected do you address the Damascus affair of 1840? Um, no, I don't go that far. I'll, I'll start with the Damascus affair. Um, I don't go that far, but I do mention the Damascus affair in one, uh, co in one context. That is, uh, many of the early modern sources that we know that may not have survived now the war, for instance, or may have. Um, we know from uh, the moments where such accusations took place in the 19th century. And these anti-Jewish accusations then prompted scholars to go to the archives and dig out if they were defending Jews, some of those defending papal bulls and other you know, imperial decrees that were um, saying Jews were innocent of such crimes or such accusations. Um, or uh, anti-Semites who were saying, look, look how many times Jews were accused of such things and therefore it is plausible that they did it. So, so the Damascus affair starts that uh, phenomenon of publication of uh, documents related to past early modern medieval blood libels um, as part of the kind of contextualization or defense or condemnation of Jews in these various cases. So Damascus and then Tisha Eslar and, Tisha and others um, that came, came out of it. In terms of the activation of scapegoating, if there was a, a need for scapegoating for something, uh, then it definitely you can see this, this mechanism. Often these are are invented in moments of um, political expediency. That is the, the death of a given child is just used for some political expediency um, in, in ways of, oh, let's, you know, let's get back the property or let's get back, um, you know, the glory of the town or something like that. So you don't necessarily need to blame Jews, this is more of a phenomenon for the, uh, for the, during plague, blaming Jews for the plague, scapegoating them in the, such a way. Here, you, you mostly have a kind of instrumentalization of a child's death for other kind of political uh, or social reasons. I will take two more questions and I think then we can conclude. One is, um, relates to the comparative, uh, uh, comparative as if, is there any comparative aspect of this? Do you know any other group that has some kind of, some story of this sort uh, that, that has such a libel, I don't know, a libel or that sticks to them throughout history and 
changes over time? I, I would have to um, say that um, in modern times, and I don't know how far this goes, but I certainly didn't see it in my material. So I think it might be a modern story. But the Roma people have been accused of kidnapping children for whatever reason. And I don't know, I'm, I certainly heard it. Um, I grew up in Poland and I don't know whether it was a transposed on them and at what point does it transpose, does it get transposed of them? But you certainly um, see that. Um, some people have made connections with witches, but it's, it's, it, it doesn't connect well and uh, in, in that kind of uh, way. So I, studying uh, Europe, I can't think of any group. But then again, Jews play a very, very unusual role in Christian imagination. So, um, so it, we, we shouldn't expect that Muslims or other groups would be equally, they, they, they come up in different ways, but, in, um, but not as consistently, certainly not in the Christian world. And maybe scholars of other cultures and other geographies would, would have similar you know, phenomena. Yeah, and now I will ask uh, the last question and I, I will add some, um, add some uh, uh, you, you spoke pre pretty much about, and you write a lot about this uh, nexus of technology, modernity and racism or anti-Semitism or, or any kind of hate uh, ideology or whatever you want to call it. Um, because your book is, as, as much as it's about anti-Semitism is about knowledge production. And so one asks, can you speak more generally on the relation between technology, media, and racism? Or this is the question, but you can open it to not only racism, but you know, all kinds of, of anti-Semitism, racism, and the yeah. And world. Yeah, no, um, it's an important question. And, and, all, and certainly uh, one of the, one of the uh, things that, made me aware and made certain clear things clearer for me as I was writing the book was the 2016 election. And it became very clear that some of the phenomena that we were experiencing in the United States and across the world about with disinformation, with confirmation bias, with dissemination through you know, channels of, of knowledge, uh, were in some way reflecting the same phenomena that I was seeing in the early modern period. That is, there is um, once something is created and then it is disseminated through the use of media by repetition and by uh, then uh, being accepted also through semi-authoritative or authoritative figures, it becomes a fact, right? So what was something, oh, you know, I heard that in a village, so-and-so Jews killed a child. Oh, did you hear that? You know, this kind of a oral rumor. Once it was written down and then put in writing and then in certain authoritative chronicles, and then it became a fact that, that came repeated, 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 and then had a life of, of, of its own. Uh, and this is why I had a hard time um, producing maps. And when I, the map that is in the book actually led to the creation of the website because it was highly unsatisfying. I didn't want to put maps where, you know, all over and you'd glance at the map and like, oh my gosh, so many Jews were, you know, in so many places accused because I knew that in some places this didn't happen, but we just had these quote unquote facts in, in, in some mentions here and there. Um, so that's why the dynamic maps allow you to sort of filter through what kind of sources, it's only literary sources or it's legal sources that just get killed. Do we know what we know uh, became a, a kind of way of nuancing it because I was afraid, I was so keenly aware that I didn't want to contribute to that kind of, 
you know, the footnote that then some anti-Semites would use and say, you know, Tether says that Jews did that in that town. <laughs> um, so I would qualify that language, but it's definitely linked to once it's something produced and then disseminates and a enters the consumption, it becomes a resource to be uh, deployed whenever it is polit politically expedient. Okay, I think uh, I think this uh, answer is a very this answer is a very good point to conclude with. Uh, thank you very very much, Magda. It was such a interesting talk and such an honor and such a pleasure. And I thank, thank um, uh, all the audience for attending, and of course. Uh, the Institute of Holocaust Genocide and Memory Studying in UMass and Alon and Paz, who is behind the scenes. And we hope to see you all uh, next uh, in our next uh, third year of encounters. Thank you so much for having me. And if anybody has any more questions that I may not have gotten to, please feel free to contact me. I'm very uh, easily found <laughs> if you Google my name. Uh, it's mtether at forum.edu. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you for reading the book. And I hope to hear from other readers. Yeah, and I will add the last comment we got on the Q&A. It's a fabulous book website, by the way. So oh, good. Go to good. the website as well. Yes, so play with the images and play with the maps. So thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye.